What arms and armour did the Knights Templar actually use? Hi folks, Matt Eason here of Scholar Gladiatoria. Now this question was inspired by watching a brilliant documentary on History Hit who are sponsoring this video. More about that in a little bit. But I've previously uh, listened to the full audio book of Dan Jones's um, fantastic seminal work on the Templars. And also of course, like many of you out there, I've seen a lot of the popular media representations of Templars in TV and movies. The fact is that the Templars always enjoyed a sort of legendary status even in the Middle Ages ages, but particularly in recent times, and they've been associated with all sorts of wild and wacky theories in some cases, as well as some very exciting and very good um, books and history documentaries. However, um, we should remember that the Knights Templar are just one knightly order. Yes, okay, they were probably the most uh, wealthy and in some ways the most important uh, knightly order in the crusading period, but there were many other knightly orders as well, most famously the Knights Hospitaller, which actually actually were formed in 1099 and therefore slightly predate the Templars. But nevertheless, this video is about the Templars. Now I get the impression that lots of people assume that because the Templars have been likened to special forces, which of course is not really a term which fits within the medieval world particularly well, but nevertheless, because they've been defined as that in popular media, a lot of people think that they had different arms and equipment. Well, did they actually? Well, the fact is they were very well funded and a lot of the people that joined the Knights Templar were from very wealthy families. Not all of them, but some of them were. And so therefore some of them came to the Knights Templar with superior equipment and some of them would have been provided with superior equipment it, after they joined, like by the actual order themselves. So I think it's fair to say that they were probably for the most part at the front cutting edge of what was normal arms and armor in any given time. And what was the time period of the Templars? We're talking about around 1119 all the way through to around 1312. So we're really talking about the early 12th century all the way through to the beginning of the 14th century. And during that period, medieval Europe saw a rapid development of arms and armor, particularly of armor, and it sort of accelerated towards the end of that period. So what we're gonna look at here is what was the cutting edge arms and armor for knights across this period from the early 12th century to the early 14th century. And therefore, what would Templar Knights have been wearing at these various times? Now, before I go on, as mentioned, this video is sponsored by History Hit, linked below, and I've got a fantastic offer for you. Obviously, a lot of you who are watching this channel are gonna love history as much as I do. And as mentioned, History Hit are the kind sponsors for this video. Imagine taking all of the history shows and topics that you love, all of those documentaries, and squeezing them into one place. That's History Hit. History Hit covers a massive variety of topics and all periods of history. Imagine Netflix, but it's all history. And it's got hundreds and hundreds of hours of content. And you can access it absolutely anywhere, on your phone, on your tablet, on your TV, on your PC. And it's got world-renowned experts on it with unique material you will only find there. And in addition to the massive amount of content already on there, they add two programs every week. And they're constantly adding new podcasts as well, which also includes the award-winning Dan Snow's History Hit. So as mentioned, the most recent documentary I watched on History Hit was the Templar Knights, the Knights Templar with Dan Jones, who's one of the most famous experts who writes about and researches the Templars. One of the great things about Dan Snow's interview of Dan Jones here is that he delves into some little nitty gritty details of topics which I haven't seen previously in Dan Jones's writings or documentaries. One of the things I hadn't really appreciated before, which I really took away from this uh, lecture interview, was how the kingship of France was so fundamental to the downfall of the Templars. And actually, in many ways, their downfall had more to do with French kingship, kingship at the time than it actually did to do with anything that they were particularly doing. So I'm sure you want to give History Hit a try for yourself, and why not? And I've got a great offer you, for you here, which is the code, it's on screen, and we've got it linked below, and it is the code, appropriately, Scholar Gladiatoria. And that gets you 50% off for the first three months. And this would also make a great present for someone else as well, uh, someone who might be interested in this. So think about that for yourself or for someone else, or it could be something for the whole family to enjoy. So for just a few pounds or dollars per month, you can get absolutely tons of content 
content and it's forever growing, growing all the time, tons of stuff there. So check out that link below or use the code um, on screen, Scholar Gladiatoria, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. And thanks again to History Hit for sponsoring this video and this channel. Cheers. So thanks a lot for sticking with me. Now let's get back to the main topic of this video, which is the arms and armour of the Knights Templar across the entire period of their existence. And something I really want to reiterate is the Knights Templar weren't separate to the rest of the knightly orders in this sense. They would have, for the most part, used the same arrangement of arms and armour of any other knights of their time. There's no evidence, no evidence whatsoever, to suggest that they were using particularly different or special arms and armour. But it is fair to say that due to their funding and due to the people that joined the order, in a lot of cases they would have had the best examples and the most high-tech and cutting-edge examples of weapons and armour for their time. So let's delve into this. Now first of all, where does this evidence come from? How do I know? How do I magically, mystically know what arms and armour they had at the time? Quite simply because we look at medieval source material, primarily artistic. Now we can refer to written sources, but written sources, particularly in this period, tend to be relatively vague. They tend to refer to a hauberk of mail or a great helm or a shield. So we can't tell exactly what they look like. But when we look at the manuscripts, when we look at the sculpture on churches, for example, when we look at the uh, knightly effigies of rich people who were buried and had tombs, uh, we can see a chronological development of arms and armour across the decades, in fact, in some cases. And sometimes we can be very precise to a decade or at least to 20 or 30 years to when a certain type of, for example, helmet was developed and we can see the evolution of it. So at the very beginning, going back to around 1119, well, many of you will have seen pictures during your life of the Bayer Tapestry. And you'll notice in the Bayer Tapestry, people have a male hauberk, um, and, uh, which is a male shirt, essentially. And they have a conical helmet with a, what we call a nasal coming down the nose. And um, they carry a long teardrop shaped shield, sometimes known as a Norman shield or a kite shield sometimes. And uh, they principally carry a lance or spear on horseback, sometimes on foot as well, and a sword as a sidearm. That is, it's worn at the side. This is basically the armament that we go into the First Crusade with. Now, bear in mind, the First Crusade is before the Knights Templar are actually formed. However, that's the sort of foundation, that's the background from where we work from. So, if we look at how knights, the top level knights were equipped in 1190, it's really not very different or barely different at all to Norman knights as shown on the Bayer Tapestry in 1066. So we're talking about male hauberks, male shirts um, that come down to about the mid thigh or knee at the most. Um, and then we're talking about conical open faced helmets with a nasal, a long shield which protects the legs either on foot or on horseback, principal weapons being a lance and a sword. And that's the same when we go into the First Crusade. Now, how's that changed by 1119 when the first uh, Knights Templar are created? Aside from the fact that the Knights Templar's original mission was to protect travellers to the Holy Land so that they evolved, their job evolved over time and in fact massively expanded and obviously famously they went into banking and things like that and all sorts of other stuff and got involved in big battles. Initially their principal aim was to protect travellers going to the Holy Land because it was a very dangerous journey. And um, we could expect those initial knights not necessarily to have had the absolute cutting edge, but nevertheless at this time, arms and armour hadn't changed an awful lot. So what they principally would have had was exactly like on the Bayer Tapestry, it would have been principally conical or slightly rounded helmets. To a certain point, the conical helmets became a little bit more rounded after 1100 with a nasal to protect the nose, with a male shirt, with a long teardrop shield, a lance or spear on foot, um, same weapon either used on horseback or foot, essentially a large spear, and a sword as a sidearm, cruciform shape, cross guard, double edged. Now in fact we can look at various knightly effigies or indeed, indeed manuscripts from the 1100s, and in fact all the way through to the middle of the 1100s, so decades after the Templars were first formed, they're still essentially wearing the same kit. Top level knights are wearing almost the same. But there is one change and that is they are now almost universally wearing long male sleeves with mittens on the end. So 
Or we can also say legs as well. So uh, in some cases they're wearing uh, chausses, in other words, male leggings that come all the way down the leg. So what has changed from, let's say, the Battle of Hastings or the Bayeux Tapestry in 1066, say to 100 years later in 1166, is essentially the male has got longer and covered more. So it now fully covers the head except for an opening of the face. It covers the full arms down to mittens on the hands, uh, which have a little slit of leather on the inside, incidentally, so you can grip weapons with a slit that you can slide the hand out of and let the mittens hang free if you want to have your hands outside of the mittens. A long shirt coming down to about the knees, a male chausses on the legs and feet. So the knight is now covered from head to foot in male armour. Now as we get into the later 1100s, so 1160, 70, 80, this kind of period, a few interesting things start happening to do with armour. Now it's possible that some of this was maybe um, inspired by the Crusades, it's difficult to tell. But uh, one of the most noticeable things that happens is that rounded hel helmet. Remember, it started off conical, like in the bear tapestry, then it became more rounded. Now they start to um, assume a somewhat flat top. We don't know exactly why, uh, but nevertheless, they start to assume a flat top, and I would say they look a little bit larger on the effigies as well. Now, interestingly, around the same time, that famous Norman-shaped shield, which up until now has basically remained unchanged, Perhaps it got slightly shorter, you could debate that. Uh, but the top of the shield starts to become flatter as well. So essentially we get flatter topped helmets, flatter topped shields. The body armour still seems to be pretty much the same. Now there are two other things which should also be mentioned. During out this whole period, compared to, let's say, the Bayer Tapestry, Something that's been covering knight's armour this whole time is what some people might call the surcoat. Uh, that is a cloth garment that's worn over the top, um, tabard-like, over the top of, um, of the male. We don't know exactly why it was introduced. Um, some people would probably argue it's for heraldic reasons, although there don't necessarily seem to be any heraldic devices shown on the earliest ones. They just simply be there, seem to be there as fabric, so we don't know exactly. Um, but the other thing which we could also note is that generally speaking, we could say that uh, swords have changed very slightly in design. They tend to have longer cross guards, although you did get some long cross guards at the time of the Battle of Hastings, for example, in 1066, generally speaking, long cross guards become completely universal and found everywhere in the 1100s. And pommel shapes start to evolve a little bit as well. Now, by the 1180s, a number of interesting things are going on. First of all, most helmets are really quite flat on top now, a bit like the top of an early great helm, but they don't, for the most part, yet have facial protection, but, in addition to the normal nasal helmets, which absolutely predominate at this time, we start to see very occasional sightings in the period art, in manuscripts and, and sculptures, of a face protector added on the front. Now, don't for now think about the later period Great Helm, which we'll get to in due course, which is like a bucket that goes over the whole head. These are just face plates. So where these seem to have stemmed from is the opening that we have in the male here, and you have a nasal up the middle. They essentially fit a face plate with perforations to see and breathe through on the front to kind of augment the existing armor. So it's not a whole new type of helmet, it's just a face plate to fill that hole. Presumably, um, because it's one of the most exposed areas, but perhaps they were fi finding more increasingly that uh, archery and crossbows were a problem. These are all hypotheses that various people have uh, conjectured. I'm not going to get into that line of thinking right now. By the year 1200, if we, particularly if we look at um, grave slabs and effigies and things like this, there is a lot going on with helmets at this time. So for the most part, the rest of the um, armor and equipment uh, and weapons have stayed pretty much the same for the last few decades with the exception of the shield. However, the helmet is clearly undergoing some attention and some evolution at this time. And we start to see increasing use of faceplate, faceplate. And the earliest appearances around 1200 and the beginning of the 1200s of what we might call a great helm. Now, it's worth mentioning at this point that great helms, when people produce art associated with the th f first three crusades, great helms seem to be the archetypal crusader helmet. But it's very important to note that they didn't really appear until after the third crusade. The earliest ones with the faceplates were just around at the time of the Third Crusade. They would have been in a minority and not normal in any way. So when you see 
representations of people in the time of, for example, uh, Saladin and, and Richard the Lionheart wearing great helms is not really correct. Most knights at that time would have had a flat-topped helmet that would have had a nasal but would have left the face open. Only some knights at this time would have had a faceplate and great helms really don't come around until just after the Third Crusade. Was there some association there with the Third Crusade? We don't know. It could have been to do with wars in Europe, could have been to do with wars in the East, we just don't know. So, um, the helmet. The helmet at this time does start to assume a more great helm shape in sort of 1200-1210. And in addition to that, there's an increasing tendency on tombs to show the knight with a helmet taken off and they have just have a male coif, which is at this time attached to the male shirt. But you'll notice the shape of the head is a bit sort of mushroom-like. It's very wide and quite flat on top. Now, this could be due to padding. It could be due to what we call a sevelia, that is a plate underneath the male. Um, we don't really know. Now, in the early 1200s, there's another great question that we don't really know the answer to, and that is, what was being worn under the surcoat. So for many, many years, when I was studying um, arms and armor at university 25 years ago, the assumption was that uh, you, you had a padded gambeson type material, then you'd have mail, then you'd have a surcoat, and that was it. However, um, I studied, particularly in, in the third year of my degree, I wrote a dissertation on the development of something called the coat of plates, which is a type of armor which is famously from the 14th century, so later, but it comes from somewhere. And in fact, we see the earliest examples of it in the 1200s. Now, we don't know how common they were, but we find references to them in texts, and we also find deep sort of clues to them in art. And very occasionally, uh, there's a couple of effigies where you can see something buckled at the side underneath the surcoat. So over the male, but under the surcoat. Also, we have this word, cuirass, or cuirass, uh, if you're English or American, but uh, from cuirass in French, it means uh, a leather thing. So cuir is uh, French for leather. So there's an implication that maybe there was a leather garment being worn on the chest area. In addition, there are references to uh, Richard the Lionheart, for example, wearing an iron plate on his chest uh, in a joust, I believe, if I remember correctly. So that could be specialized jousting armor. But nevertheless, we start to get all these clues around the year 1200, maybe just, just before in, in Richard's case, where we start to find references to things being worn on the chest that are plate-like. However, art is, gives us very scant details, largely because the surcoat is shown over the mail. So, we don't know what's there, we don't know how common it was. My guess, my educated guess, based on many years of looking at this material, is that forms of chest uh, probably chest and in some cases back, uh, sort of upper thorax protection, um, sometimes of queer uh, bui, uh, which is boiled leather, uh, sometimes of um, metal, sometimes of small plates attached to leather. Um, these types of things I think were coming into occasional use. I don't think they were normal and I don't by any means think they were universal at this time around 1200, but I think it's worth you knowing that they did exist in some form. So as we move into the 1200s and towards 1250, actually surprisingly little change. The most noticeable change is in helmets. And the great helm, the true great helm, which, which comes all the way down to below the chin and goes all the way around. Initially, remember we started off with a faceplate, and then the faceplate seems to have grown around the sides of the helmet and then finally to have gone all the way around the helmet. So essentially we already had the flat topped open face helmet with a nasal, that had a faceplate added to it and the faceplate basically grew around the back and it took you know a few decades for that to go from becoming a new thing to a normal thing to then an evolved normal thing. So that by the kind of 1220s, 1230s, we start to see great helms a lot in art and they start to become very, very common. However, don't ever think, and if we go to something like the, um, the Morgan Bible, you can clearly see there that while fully developed great helms are now in use and not that uncommon, they are worn alongside still rounded topped open faced nasal helmets. So great helms were never completely universal for knights, they were one option. Um, and in some cases, possibly the great helm was worn over the top of one of those nasal helmets. That's one of the things we have some evidence for. 
So um, in some cases you might wear a great helm for the full-on cavalry charge, but for skirmishing actions or fighting on foot you might just wear an open-faced nasal helmet because clearly you can see, hear, talk, um, eat and breathe better in an open face helmet than you can in a great helm. But anyway, this is the main change to the arms and armor um, at this time that starts to happen is in helmets. Shields continue to be more or less the same shape. They're typical knightly heater shaped shields. Um, Male armour predominates from what you can see, although it is likely that the earliest forms of coat of plate and cuirass and breastplate, if you want to call them that, were starting probably to become a little bit more common in the middle of the 1200s, because we know that by the end of the 1200s, the coat of plates is pretty much a normal thing. So it's likely that by 1250, uh, for example, we can see this on the famous um, St. Morris um, uh, statue in Germany, it's likely that the coat of plates was pretty well developed by this point. Now there is one other new development which starts to come around in this kind of 1220s, 1230s period, so before 1250, um, that seems like a really small thing, but actually led to really important things, and that is knee defences. Now we don't know, again, we don't know the exact construction of these, but we can see them in art, we can see them in uh, sculptures, we can see them in tomb monuments, and these appear to be a sort of solid wrap around the knee. Now in some cases, I think most people argue these are probably usually hardened leather or kerbuli. Uh, um, so some type of hardened leather, but there's nothing to say that some of them weren't metal. They could have been um, Latin, as we would sometimes call it, copper alloy, brass, bronze. Um, some of them might have even been iron or, or steel. Um, but the fact is that they are hard knee defences. And of course, if you're sitting on a horse, the knees are a very valid target and a vulnerable target, both from people on foot and other people on horse. And anybody can tell you who's been hit hard in the knee with something, and I've been hit hard in the knee with swords a few times in my life, um, it blooming hurts and it can disable you really quickly. Um, so it's understandable absolutely why you'd want to put hard defences on the knee. You know, even modern construction workers wear knee, knee defences. Many modern soldiers wear knee, uh, knee defenders as well. So defending the knees, you can sort of see why out of all the limb parts and all of the joints, they were the first ones to get protected. And that's why they're important. It's important to note they were the first limb part to regularly get a sort of solid protection over the top of the mail or chain mail um, because of course mail armour is very good against cuts and pretty good against thrusts but it's not very good against impacts, blunt weapon impact. And on that topic it is worth noting that this period also started to see an increased use of maces and axes as impact weapons, as impact sidearms to use either after the lance had been expended, or in some cases perhaps instead of using the lance uh, in warfare. Um, the sword was still the sidearm, so somebody carrying a mace or an axe would generally also have a sword, so they weren't replacing the sword. But it's clear that the combination of padded armour, the combination of head-to-foot mail, really good helmets uh, with enclosed faces, uh, and possibly and probably the coat of plates on the torso meant that knights were becoming better and better armoured in the middle of the 1200s, such that axes and maces and fighting on foot, certain types of um, bardiche-like weapons and glaives and things like this, started to become increasingly important for knights to overcome other knights, because without these weapons of greater impact and greater potency, it was now becoming, very clearly, it was becoming very difficult to take out enemy knights and beat them into submission because they were so well protected. So armour at this time, although it's not full plate harness of the 15th century, is still clearly very good at doing its job because the weapons were having to evolve rapidly to deal with it. We see similar developments in the early developments of um, large uh, longbows, warbows, but also um, crossbows as well. Crossbows were getting more powerful and some people have argued that it's a, it's a sort of um, uh, chicken and egg thing is that the armour may have developed heavier because of the archery it was facing. Then again the couched lance, very powerful as well. So it's always this interchange between weapons and armour. Swords incidentally at this time hadn't changed an awful lot. Uh, we do start to see somewhat more tapered blades which makes them a little bit more nimble um, and a little bit better for thrusting. 
the hilts do change in minor ways which is really something for a video by itself but overall swords don't change an awful lot in this period other than becoming a little bit better suited to thrusting um, and we should also mention this is also the period that we start to see daggers being used more in warfare. Now, this might be against what a lot of people in the modern world think because we're so used to thinking of a knife or a dagger as a common sidearm, but actually there was a period there where there's no evidence at all for knights carrying any type of knife or, or dagger. As I said, if we go back to the Third Crusade, the standard ar armaments, standard weapons, apart from the shield, were the lance and the sword. Um, we start to see the first mentions in the Second and Third Crusades of the uses of maces, and Richard the Lionheart apparently used an axe, according to some sources. Um, but that was, again, fairly early for the use of the mace and the axe. And in fact, in fact funnily enough, the Pope gave a specific decree uh, for the Crusaders to use um, the Muslims' weapons, in this case the mace, uh, against them, because you weren't supposed to use Muslim weapons if you were a Crusader. But the mace was so effective against armoured fighters, they were given permission to use them. And interestingly, this is the exact same period that we see daggers, specialised military daggers, the Quillon dagger and so-called Misericord. For example, if we look at the Morgan Bible again, you can see them liberally being used. And this is one of the earliest sources from about 1250 that we actually see daggers being extensively used in warfare. You just don't see it before that. What does that mean? What does that tell us? I don't know, but it could be that again the armour has got so good that you're having to introduce new types of weapon to overcome your now heavily armoured opponents. Now as we go into the later 1200s, so after 1250, you'll remember that in the 1250s or thereabouts, uh, knee protectors start to become relatively common in the period art. As we go into the late 1200s, um, the two main things that we can, well, we can deduce uh, in one case and see in the other case uh, that really st were focusing on in armour development at this time was the helmet and the torso protection. The limbs, for the most part, and this is actually quite important to sort of take on board, the limbs continued to be almost entirely protected almost only by mail. Okay, so the arms fully covered in mail, long sleeves with mittens, mitten, chainmail mittens, and the legs covered in full mail shorts, very often, if not always, with knee protectors wrapped around in the late 1200s. Now, the helmet. We don't see these on tombs very much because the helmet's removed so you can see the face, but if we look in manuscripts, we can see that the helmet has continued to develop. So the helmet has got bigger, the helmet has now very long uh, sides, and it has a fairly standard format of two slits with a load of breath holes below that, um, with a somewhat more conical top than before. Not quite as flat topped as it were, was. So it's now better suited to deflection. It's also, I would say, for the most part, slightly bigger and slightly further away from the head. The torso. The coater plates. So this we need to deduce, and uh, this was one of the focuses of um, of foci of of uh, my degree all those years ago. Um, was trying to see what you can't see essentially, and you need to look in written texts. You need to look at tangential. Sometimes you see little hints of it in the artwork. We also see from the shape of the surcoat that very often in the late 1200s it looks like there's a slightly unnatural shape to the surcoat, which I think it's because it's sitting over a coat of plates. And we know that at this time from written records, the coat of plates was increasingly a normal thing in the late 1200s as we go towards 1300. So the main changes that have happened in the late 1200s are the coat of plates on the body has got more developed, which the coat of plates incidentally now almost always probably consists of iron plates secured on the inside, very occasionally perhaps on the outside of a garment that the circuit goes over. So you put your male shirt on over your padded gambeson, over the top of that, you put a garment that's a little bit like a poncho with plates on the inside, and then over that, you put the surcoat, and then you do a belt around the whole lot to keep it all together. Um, so you've now got a plated torso, but the arms and legs, remember, are still almost entirely covered with mail. Now, the next development which starts to appear in the 1290s, in fact, we can find earlier examples than that in the 1280s, but I think reliably start to appear in the 1290s, 
uh, again not universal but we do start to see it more often are greaves now i've always found it more amazing that greaves weren't introduced earlier on as anyone who's ever smashed their shin into something hard or been whacked in the shin uh, much like the knee it hurts a lot um, uh, anyway they added greaves uh, presumably they hadn't found them particularly necessary with the mail and padding that was worn before that um, but they added greaves in the 1290s and certainly at the beginning these greaves are literally gutter shaped plates probably usually of iron but some people would argue that they may have been kerbuli or boiled leather um, on the front of the shin only so you can still see the mail wrapped around the leg behind by about the year 1300 so we're getting to the very close to the end of the templars now um, they were starting to have arm defenses under or over uh, the male sleeves and we sometimes see upper um, arm defenders strapped on and we sometimes see a little plate on the elbow but it's also really important to mention that in the year 1300 while we do occasionally see those things they are still an absolute minority as far as we can tell most people seem to have just had male sleeves and male trousers at this point and in fact that's a very important point to take on board and memorize because all the way through to about 1320 it's very common in manuscript art and um, paintings and sculpture and tomb effigies to still see purely male chain mail um, length sleeves with mittens and all the way down the legs and covering the feet with no plate defenses on the limbs at all so when you see reconstructions of templar knights with articulated shoulder pauldrons and spalders and things like this it's completely wrong completely and utterly wrong so bear in mind the Templars run up to about 1312 so absolutely for the Templars time we should see nothing but male sleeves or if it's right at the end so from about 1290 95 1300 maybe some very rudimentary arm defenses as far as helmets are concerned it's worth mentioning that the great helm continued to de develop its shape but fundamentally it's still a great helm it's still fairly similar and we know that sometimes these were worn over the coif which incorporated either separately or part of it what's called a sevelia and the sevelia is essentially a steel skull cap that goes underneath the great helm so it's a bit like you're wearing two helmets as well as the male coif um, um, this um, sevelia is what would go on to develop into the bassinet uh, later on but that's really after our period or at least uh, yeah it's really kind of after our period so at this date uh, we're still looking at great helm as the now the principal helmet the nasal helmets had disappeared but very often people would fight with the great helm off and what you would see is a male coif but with a somewhat unnatural shape largely because underneath it was probably some padding and very often uh, or possibly usually a sevelia that is a plate iron or steel cap underneath the mail. Now briefly to talk about weapons, the trend that we saw in the 1200s would continue up to 1300. That is an increased use of maces and axes. Uh, even the very first earliest forms really of, of things that pole axe were starting to develop by this point for use on foot. The lance for the most part hadn't really changed very much as far as I'm aware. The sword had evolved in shape somewhat uh, again we start to see more tapered shapes more more acute tips for piercing um, and the cross guards now came in various different forms the pommels uh, tendencies had changed but in terms of overall function what we could loosely say about swords is they'd become a little bit more thrust centric than they were 100 years earlier uh, almost certainly to do with um, armor um, and uh, but for the most part weapons hadn't changed an awful lot apart from swords daggers and knives were worn more commonly now maces and axes and war hammers sometimes were used more often than they had been 100 or 200 years earlier and uh, lances hadn't changed an awful lot one notable thing which did happen in the second half of the 1200s was the more common appearance in art of what we would now call the longsword that is a two-handed um, length grip on a large sword now these weren't big two-handers or anything like that they were essentially arming swords with elongated hilts but we do increasingly start to see the use of two hands on a sword 
as we move towards the year 1300. But again, I should reiterate that because we see them doesn't mean they were common and they weren't common as far as we can tell. The arming sword, the simple one-handed sword that you wear at your side and use with a shield, was still by far the most common type of sword used by knights and all soldiers at this time. So while long swords, early forms of long sword, start to appear in the second half of the 1200s and uh, just after 1300, while they start to appear, they are not yet common. So in the very last bit of our period here, running up to 1312, around 1310, we could say that in some cases, some very well-off knights did have an increasing amount of plate defense on their arms and legs. However, I think it's really important to emphasize here that that was not universal and that there were still loads of knights whose arms and legs were predominantly only covered in mail, aka chainmail, at this time. Um, the torsos, coated plates, was normal by this point. The heads, a great helm, in some cases over a Sevelia, so one or two helmets uh, and a male coif. But um, plate defences on the arms and legs, yes, while they were present, uh, in some cases in quite developed forms by about 1310, 1320, they were not universal yet and lots of people wouldn't have had them yet. The Knights Templar, I think on the most part, would have had the most cutting edge stuff um, and it would have depended partly where they were from. So um, one who was out in the Holy Land or one who was in Scotland or one who was in France might have differing access to different bits of kit. And it does seem to me, looking at the two effigies, that um, English armour, particularly in the limbs, was actually really quite well developed at this point. That being said, it was in Italy as well, but if we look at a lot of French monuments, a lot of them only had mail on their arms and legs. So um, I think it probably partly depended who you were, where you were, what rank you were in the Templars, because remember, of course, you've got a ranking structure there. Uh, so I hope this has been useful and interesting to you. Remember to check out those uh, links below. And thanks again uh, to History Hit for sponsoring this video. I hope that has been a relatively concise, because it's a very detailed topic, run through the arms and armour of the Knights Templar across this period. Thanks a lot for watching and I hope I'll see you back on the channel soon. Cheers folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks.